you're on the wards and you see a red flag pop up next to potassium in your patient's morning labs. You order a quick 40 mil equivalent dose of potassium chloride and quickly type replete to four in your progress note. But why do we do this? Why do we care about hypokalemia? In this video, we're gonna define hypokalemia. We're gonna talk a little bit about why it's so important to identify it, and then we'll dive into our strategy for correcting it with either IV or oral potassium repletion. So first, what is considered hypokalemia? Hypokalemia is defined as a drop in serum potassium to less than 3.5. And a low serum potassium indicates that there's either a total body deficit of potassium or that potassium has shifted into cells. We've seen in observational studies that hypokalemia is associated with increased risk of developing cardiac arrhythmias, like VTAC. In particular, we see this association in patients with underlying cardiac disease, such as our patients who might have had previous MIs, a history of cardiac surgery, and patients who are undergoing active diuresis. So great. Now that you know how to identify hypokalemia, we can move on to the next step, which is how to correct it. If patients have no cardiac risk factors, do not have ongoing potassium losses, and are tolerating PO intake, then repleting their potassium is less urgent, especially if they're only mildly hypokalemic or asymptomatic. Instead of medically repleting these patients, you can encourage them to eat potassium-rich foods, like figs, dried fruits, and avocados. Our target for repletion should be low normal, between 3.5 and 4, and we should aim closer to 4 for patients who have higher cardiac risk. Who are these patients with higher cardiac risk again? These are patients who are post-acute MI, or cardiac surgery, and patients with ongoing losses, like our patients who are undergoing active diuresis for heart failure. For these patients, potassium repletion is much more urgent. There are two methods for potassium repletion. We've got IV and PO. PO repletion is preferred unless the patient's unable to take medication by mouth. For example, if your patient is vomiting or has dysphagia, they should be repleted with IV potassium. The same goes for patients who are poor absorbers, like patients who have an IBD flare or who have undergone bariatric surgery. A rule of thumb for repletion is that 10 mil equivalents of potassium increases serum potassium by 0.1 mil equivalents per liter. Generally, up to 40 to 60 mil equivalents can be given in one dose, depending how much your patient can tolerate at one time without causing any GI upset. And if additional repletion is necessary, we can consider dividing the potassium into multiple doses. These doses can be timed to be given after a dose of diuretic. We tend to see this pattern of dosing for our patients who might be requiring more frequent diuresis for heart failure, in which case you would expect ongoing losses of potassium. For PO potassium, we have several options depending on your hospital formulary. One of the most common formulations we see is potassium chloride. We should reach for this if your patient has a metabolic alkalosis. Think about your patients who might be undergoing aggressive diuresis for heart failure and have a resulting contraction alkalosis. If your patient has kidney stones, reach for potassium citrate. Citrate chelates the calcium filtered by the kidneys and prevents stones from forming. That's why we recommend orange juice for patients with recurrent stones, because it contains high levels of citrate. And if your patient has a phosphate deficit, reach for potassium phosphate. Now, switching gears quickly to IV potassium. Generally, IV potassium on most hospital formularies is in the form of potassium chloride. It's usually ordered to run at a maximal rate of 10 mil equivalents an hour. We run IV potassium at a slower rate because this prevents big swings in potassium that can put your patients at risk for cardiac events. If your patient's severely deficient and you need to be more aggressive with your repletion strategy, be sure to hook them up to telemetry to closely monitor their rhythm. And one more thing to keep in mind is that unfortunately, IV potassium can cause significant pain and discomfort at the infusion site for patients. If your patient is having trouble tolerating this discomfort, try it at a slower rate dilute it with normal saline, or apply an ice pack to the site. So far, we've talked a lot about repletion, but that's only one part of our treatment strategy. If we want to prevent further losses of potassium and not just replace what was lost, we need to take a look at the patient's med list. Here are some of the common offenders that drive down potassium. Antibiotics, particularly IV penicillin in large doses, and also aminoglycosides and fluoroquinolones can cause hypokalemia. 
Proton pump inhibitors also cause hypokalemia, which is actually driven by magnesium wasting. So, pro tip, if your patient has a low mag and mild hypokalemia, try repleting their magnesium first. This will likely improve their potassium deficiency. The last few meds on our list of common offenders are laxatives, diuretics, and steroids. This seems like a lot to remember. So one way to remember a few of these common culprits is the pesky P's, where P is for penicillin, PPI, prednisone for steroids, poop as in laxatives, and P as in diuresis. If your patient is hypoclemic and is going to need more diuresis, consider switching from furosemide to torsemide. What's so great about torsemide, it partially acts as an aldosterone antagonist, so it allows you to get rid of that excess volume your patient's holding on to while minimizing the loss of potassium in the urine. It's also easy to transition your patients from IV to PO torsemide when they're getting ready for discharge, because as you can see here, the dose conversion is just one to one. When we are giving potassium repletion, we often see twice daily labs, especially for patients who are undergoing diuresis. But are all those repeat BMPs really necessary? The short answer is no. Follow-up labs are not always needed. As a rule of thumb, if your patient did not make a ton of urine with an output of less than one to two liters following a dose of the diuretic you gave them, then you can assume they won't be losing that much potassium in the urine and you might not need to recheck labs later that day. On the other hand, if your patient did put out a lot of urine after that diuretic dose you gave them, then it might be a good idea to recheck labs more frequently, especially if you plan on diuresing them again later.